Well, I'm uh, Father Neil. I'm the pastor here at, at St. Catharines. I know a lot of you, but a lot of you are, are new. I hope uh, I get a chance to chat with you a little bit uh, later on. But uh, um, let's just ask the Lord to, to bless our evening tonight and be with us and just open our hearts to receive his word. We'll begin in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this night and for the gift of our faith, the gift of friendship, the gift of fellowship, and the gift of your love. We pray that you would continue to enlighten our hearts and our minds, especially to the gift of your real presence in the Holy Eucharist, to the gift of your sacrifice that is made present in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, to the gift of your abiding and enduring love that is with us in your real presence, that remains with us in your presence in the Eucharist. And we entrust this evening to the intercession of our Blessed Mother as we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, some of you know, I've been a priest for about 14 years. I wasn't born a priest, though. You know, I grew up here, for the most part, in Georgia. I uh, went to St. Pius High School, and then Georgia Tech. Graduated from Georgia Tech in 2001 with a degree in information technology. Um, still kind of the IT guy in the office, as Jeremy can attest to, it's sort of my my distraction. I enjoy just sort of fiddling with things and breaking things and trying to put them back together. But um, most of my time is spent as uh, a pastor here at St. Catharines. And uh, that uh, being a pastor encompasses all sorts of things, uh, you know, running a big organization, but hopefully spending some time doing priestly things too. And I, I'm grateful just for my vocation. It's been a beautiful 14 years as a priest. Um, but I uh, went through kind of a really rough um, journey in my life, as, as probably all of us have, you know, lots of ups and downs. Um, when I was in high school, I sort of really struggled just sort of figuring out who I was and got into all sorts of trouble, some of it the sort of the typical rebellious sort of things that we all go through, through you know, as teenagers, some of it sort of a little bit unique. Uh, and then when I got to college, I... Um, Started getting more and more into my faith, but like probably a lot of us, kind of struggled with really handling my newfound freedom of being on my own for the first time and strayed a little bit. But throughout all the ups and downs, one thing was constant in my life, and that was the Mass. Um, I, I can't say that I was always a uber faithful Catholic and living a very virtuous life, uh, but say, I, can, I can't remember, I tell people, I can't remember a time in my life when I've actually ever missed Mass on Sunday. And that was just something that was ingrained in me by my mother. Um, my dad was not Catholic growing up. My mom was the one that really brought us up in the faith. Um, she was a very faithful Catholic and was sort of unequivocal um, with my dad. He was not Catholic, actually. Well, when they got married, he's since become Catholic. But she was pretty unequivocal with him that... You know, I'm going to be Catholic, we're going to go to Mass every Sunday, and the kids are going to be Catholic, and we're going to go to Mass every Sunday. And she kept to that, and my dad would often join us, even though he wasn't Catholic. Um, but he became Catholic my senior year in high school, and that's a whole other story. It's a beautiful story. Um, but as I said, yeah, I can't ever remember a time in my life actually having missed Sunday Mass. I'm sure that I did, uh, but even through college, you know, when I was sort of up and down and struggling, uh, I... I still was going to Mass. Um, and it was just, once again, something that my mother had really ingrained in us, that you got to go to Mass, um, no matter what. So when I was in college, though, I, I like to say I sort of grew up prior to that in a sort of Catholic bubble. I went to Catholic schools all my life. But then when I went to Georgia Tech, I started getting challenged about my faith. And maybe you've had this experience in college you know, people, you meet people in all walks of life, people that are not Catholic, people that are not Christian, people that are anti-Catholic, 
Um, and they might start asking you questions about the faith. And when I got to tech, I started getting people asking me questions about why do Catholics do this? Why do you believe this? I remember going to a Bible study uh, one of my first weeks there at Georgia Tech, and everybody was going around introducing themselves. And there was a Baptist uh, minister leading the Bible study. Uh, and I got to myself and I introduced myself. I said, I'm, I'm Neil, I'm, I'm, I'm Catholic. And he looked at me and he said, you're Catholic, huh? He said, so the, do you believe that the Pope is holier than everyone else? And I didn't know how to answer that question, right? And, you know, we hopefully know that, no, it doesn't mean that the Pope is actually holier than anyone. We hope he's, he's a holy guy, but it, that's not necessarily, you know, uh, you know sort of given uh, about the Pope. And we certainly believe certain things about the authority of the Pope and his teaching authority and the infallibility under certain circumstances. But, um, you know, the Pope isn't necessarily the most holy person in the world. Uh, but anyways, I didn't know how to answer that question. And there were several other instances where I uh, was challenged about my faith. And that got me on a path of really starting to study my faith on my own and asking kind of the questions that I think we all should ask at times in our lives, particularly as adults. Why do I believe what I believe? You know, why am I Catholic? And if the answer is, well, I'm Catholic just because that's how I grew up, that's how my parents sort of brought me up, then, you know, that's probably not going to sustain you as an adult. And so I want to, you know, really encourage you to ask yourself that question, you know, if you haven't already, why am I Catholic? Why am I here? What do I believe? Um, and in the end, one of the most important beliefs that we have as Catholics that's somewhat unique to us is our belief about the Eucharist. Um, and at different times in my, li in my life, in high school and college, I had pretty powerful experiences, I think, with the Eucharist, just on retreats in particular. Um, and when I was at Georgia Tech, uh, you know, I think my sophomore year, I went on a retreat and had a really powerful experience of adoration. And all of these things, you know, being challenged by faith, these sort of powerful retreat experiences, uh, were what I think God used to get me open to the possibility of a vocation, ultimately, to the priesthood. And I remember I was, I was at Georgia Tech and I was co-oping, so I was going to school a semester and then working a semester, and I was working at Georgia Power. And I remember just sitting at my desk one day, and out of the blue, I just sort of asked myself the question, well, is this what I want to do with the rest of my life? And um, the thought of the priesthood just popped in my mind out of nowhere. I'd never really thought about it. And nobody, believe it or not, had ever really encouraged me even to think about it. Um, I knew a lot of great priests growing up, one in particular that had a big impact on my life, uh, my Monsignor Lopez, who taught me at St. Pius. Some of you may know him. He's retired now. But he was a really just a phenomenal priest, just an incredible teacher, a very holy, holy man. Um, man of deep prayer. Um, but nonetheless, I never thought about being a priest myself. And I see that day of, of just sort of God putting that on my heart as really a testament to the fact that it's something that God called me to and not something that was just manufactured on my own. Um, you know, I was very happy with what I was doing in, in the IT world and enjoyed, you know, that, that, that reality. Uh, but from that moment onward, I really started getting more serious about my prayer life. And, you know, I went to see Monsignor Lopez and he kind of, I think, reinforced the idea that, all right, if you're going to be a priest someday or if you're even going to begin to discern God's will with any sort of, um, you know, accuracy, you need to really make sure that you're praying, that you're growing in your love for the Eucharist, and our Blessed Mother. And, and so I really sort of stepped up my prayer life and adoration was definitely a part of that. And even daily mass was a big part of that. Um, and then when I ended up going to seminary, you know, I struggled a lot. And I think I've told this story from the pulpit at mass, you know, that I was very close to leaving seminary a number of times. Uh, and I kind of just was, you know, having a crisis about my vocation and at times going through a real kind of spiritual dryness in my life. Uh, but once again, the, the one common was I always 
had committed to adoration, you know, each day. And in the seminary, I was making a holy hour adoration, which I've, you know, committed to doing as a priest as well. Uh, but I think that sort of faithfulness to prayer is what ultimately sort of sustained me throughout the difficult times. And, um, you know, in the end, I one day came to the, at least some, some sort of clarity in my vocation. Uh, I remember I was taking a class on the Eucharist and we had a whole semester long class on the Eucharist. And I remember the professor said something that was really profound. Um, he, he said just about his own kind of vocation story. He said, I realized that I was called to be a priest when I realized that the reason that I was born was to offer the holy sacrifice of the mass. And that really struck me. And even though I wasn't at that point in my own kind of discernment, you know, I was still really struggling and just kind of unsure if the Lord was calling me or if I wanted to be a priest. Um, I knew that if I were going to proceed forward, you know, eventually and be ordained, I knew that I had to have that same conviction, that the reason that I was born was to offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And thankfully, you know, the Lord ultimately gave me that conviction. And here I am, 14 years later, I'm a priest, and never look back. It's been a beautiful, beautiful life. And certainly the constant in my life has been the daily celebration of the Mass. Um, once again, uh, last 14 years, I've never missed a day of Mass. Yeah, I, somehow I've managed to, you know, the Lord's kept me healthy even, and even publicly I haven't missed a day of celebrating Mass in 14 years. It's been amazing. <laughs> I don't know how, but... Uh, um, so anyways, all that being said, yeah, I, I want to really talk a little bit about what the Eucharist is because it's been such an integral part in my own journey and there's so much more that I could talk about, but I want to sort of shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit of theology with you. Um, you know, when we think about the Eucharist, we can talk about the Eucharist in several different ways, right? We can talk about the Eucharist in terms of simply the real presence, right? We had adoration just now, right? We didn't celebrate the Mass, right? We had adoration, which means that we were there praying in front of the Lord, exposed in the Eucharist, right? Who is really present, we would say body, blood, soul, and divinity, right? So that's one way of sort of looking at the Eucharist, that Jesus is truly present, right? And you know, we believe in transubstantiation, right? That the, the bread and the wine are changed into the body and blood of Christ, even though the visible appearances, we call the accidents, remain the accidents or the appearances of bread and wine. We know that the substance, what it is, is truly transformed into the body and blood of Christ. And we can also talk about the Eucharist in terms of uh, simply a communal meal, Right? We come together and we partake in the Eucharist when we come to Mass. Right? We partake in the Eucharist as a community and we worship God as a community and, and partake in the feast. Right? We receive communion. Um, and then finally, you know, we can talk about the Eucharist as a sacrifice. And that's what I want to sort of focus on. And, and there's other ways of looking at you know, the eschatolot, it's a foretaste of the of the, the banquet in heaven, right? There's other ways that we can talk about the Eucharist as well, but really the, um, the real presence, the communal or sacrificial meal, and then the sacrifice are, are really the, the three main ways of talking about you know, Christ in the Eucharist. Um, but the sacrifice, I think, is the one that we really need to recover, that understanding of the Eucharist. So I think... It's, it's really profound, and I think most Catholics really don't have an appreciation for it. And that's what the Mass is really all about, right? And the thing that we do the most as Catholics is celebrate the Mass, right? I mean, hopefully we're living our lives as Catholics every day, and we're living them practically and concretely uh, in our daily lives, in our work, in our school, in our families, whatever it is. But when we come to Mass, right, this is, as the, as the Church tells us, right, the celebration of the the Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life, right? The Eucharist is everything. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, when we, um, when we talk about the Eucharist, right, we can think about it in terms of 
uh, receiving communion. You know, we come to Mass and we receive communion. We come to Mass and we're in Christ's real presence too, right? We can, you know, Christ becomes present in the Eucharist. But all of that can happen outside of the context of the Mass too, can't it? You know, once again, we just had adoration. We didn't celebrate Mass, right? But they were, were there in Christ's real presence in the Eucharist. You know, I go to the hospital all the time and bring communion to people or to the nursing home or, you know, people that are homebound. I bring them communion. They receive communion. But I haven't celebrated the Mass there, right? So there's something that's unique about the Mass, and that is the sacrifice. So on your, um, on your sheets there, I have a couple of quotes that I'm going to walk you through real quick. So this, uh, this first quote is from the compendium of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And this is sort of a condensed version of the main catechism. Hope you're familiar with the catechism. I like to say it's sort of the official textbook of the Catholic Church. Um, if you don't have a catechism, I encourage you to get one. And uh, this compendium is a really great resource as well. And it's written in a sort of question and answer format. And it really provides some great um, bite-size sort of syn syntheses of, of Catholic doctrine. Uh, so this first question, it's, it's question number 271 from the compendium, what is the Eucharist? It says, the Eucharist is the very sacrifice of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus, which he instituted per to perpetuate the sacrifice of the cross throughout the ages until his return in glory. Thus he entrusted to his church this memorial of his death and resurrection. It is a sign of unity, a bond of charity, a paschal banquet in which Christ is consumed, the mind is filled with grace, and a pledge of future glory is given to us. Right, so that's a really, I think, um, rich, theologically dense and rich uh, explanation of what the Eucharist is. Right? But from the get-go, it says, the Eucharist is the very sacrifice of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right, it's sort of laying the foundation right there. And so let's just kind of go on. In what way is the Eucharist a memorial of the sacrifice of Christ? So we said that it is the sacrifice of the cross, right? that uh, he instituted to perpetuate the sacrifice of the cross. In what way is the Eucharist a memorial of the sacrifice of Christ? The Eucharist is a memorial in the sense that it makes present an actual the sacrifice which Christ offered to the Father on the cross once and for all on behalf of, all man, of, of mankind. The sacrificial character of the Eucharist is manifested in the very words of institution. This is my body which is given for you. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood that will be shed for you. The sacrifice of the cross and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one and the same sacrifice. The priest and the victim are the same, only the manner of offering is different, in a bloody manner on the cross, in an unbloody manner in the Eucharist. So what this is telling us is that when we celebrate Mass, we are making present, priest is really making present, the sacrifice of Calvary, the sacrifice that Christ offered on the cross 2,000 years ago. Right? In this very mysterious way, through the sacri sacrifice, through the sa sacrament, right, which is the sacrifice, that sacrifice of Christ's death that he offered 2,000 years ago for our salvation, right, the sacrifice that Christ offered to save us from eternal death, to save us from sin, right, is in this very mysterious way made present to us. Right? It's almost like space and time collapse. And we're there at the sacrifice of Calvary 2,000 years ago. It's not exactly like that, but it's more we understand, right, Christ's sacrifice is an eternal sacrifice. That sacrifice, right, because he is God, is even going on in the heavenly liturgy right now. We can, hear, we can read about this in Revelation, that his sacrifice is really an eternal sacrifice, that the Lamb of God who was slain for our sins, right, is now still offering himself before the throne of the Father in heaven, right? And so we would say the sacrifice of Calvary and the eternal sacrifice of the Lamb in heaven, right, are made present to us here and now in the Mass. 
so that we are there with Christ, who is offering himself to the Father for the salvation of the world. Right? We are there with Mary, with St. John, with Mary Magdalene. Right? And what were they doing at the foot of the cross? You know, well, we think about our Blessed Mother in particular. You know, throughout her life, from the very first kind of moment of her conception, right, Mary was given this grace to be united to her son in his mission of salvation, right? And we know that Mary, right, at, her, at the Annunciation, right, God asked her to say yes to this mission, right, to be his mother. And it was only through her consent that the incarnation happened, that God became man. And throughout her life, right, she said yes and united herself to her son's mission of salvation, right? And even we think about at Pentecost, right, Mary was praying, right, in that upper room for the coming of the Holy Spirit was with the birth, which is the birth of the church. But at the foot of the cross, Mary was there, even though she was suffering. And you can imagine, right, she was sort of revolting from the fact that her son was suffering so, so um, just violently and um, just horribly, right? Nonetheless, right, Mary was uniting herself and her sufferings to Christ's suffering and consenting once again to God's will and to her son's mission for the salvation of the world. Right? And so we're going to get to then the question of, well, what are we supposed to be doing? If the, if the sacrifice of the Mass is the sacrifice of the cross, which Christ offered for the salvation of the world, then what are we supposed to do? But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I want to just sort of go back to this third point. How is the sacrifice made present? So this is from uh, Pope Pius XII in a document called Mediator Dei. Um, he says, the divine wisdom has devised a way in which our Redeemer's sacrifice is marvelously shown forth by external signs symbolic of death by the transubstantiation of bread unto the body of Christ and of wine into his blood, both his body and blood are rendered really present. But the Eucharistic species under which he is present symbolize the violent separation of his body and blood. And so a commemorative showing forth of his death, which took place in reality on Calvary, is repeated in each mass because by distinct representations, Christ Jesus is signified and shown forth in the state of a victim. Okay, that's a little complicated, but I want to go back real quick and just review some basic sacramental theology, which is really important. So when we talk about any sacraments, and hopefully you've studied this a little bit, and you know, when we talk about any sacrament, what is, what is a sacrament? Anybody give me the basic definition of a sacrament? Hmm? Say, what, what did you say it again? Yeah. So a visible sign instituted by Christ to give grace. So visible sign, right, which means some sort of ritual, right, some sort of tangible, physical, physical, visible ritual, right, and all the sacraments have some sort of visible, tangible ritual uh, instituted by Christ to give grace. And when we talk about the ritual, there's always some tangible, physical kind of reality, but also words, right? All the sacraments have those. And we refer to those technically, the visible, tangible thing as the matter, and then the words are called, what are the words called? Anybody know? Form. form, right? So matter and form. So every sacrament has matter and form. And the visible, tangible, ritual, and the words then sort of point to some spiritual reality, right? A visible sign instituted by Christ to give grace, right? Through this visible, tangible reality in the words, we receive some grace. There's some sort of spiritual effect in our souls. All right, so think about baptism. What are the matter, what's the matter of baptism? So you want to tell me? You know? Water? Yeah. What's the, uh, so we'd say that the remote matter, the remote matter of water is the baptism. That's the actual stuff, the physical thing. What's the actual ritual in baptism? We call that the proximate matter. What's that? No, that's the, the form. The, 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 no, the, what's, the vis, what's the ritual that happens in baptism? What's that? Right, so the pouring of the water, or you, know, you can be immersed into the water, right? Depending, you can use either form of the pouring. So 
It's pouring of water, right? That's the matter or the immersion into the water. And then what's the form? What are the words? Yeah, he said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, and then what does that signify, right? We said in the sacraments, there's a visible, tangible ritual that points to some spiritual reality, right? And there's a sort of a, a relationship between the visible, tangible ritual that's happening and the spiritual effect that happens in our souls. So if we think about baptism, right? The pouring of the water over the person, the washing with water, right? Or the immersion into water. What, what sort of spiritual effect does that signify, do you think? Right, so, you know, we would say the washing of the water, what happens in baptism? What's the effect of baptism? The washing away of sin, right? They're wiping away of sin, right? In baptism, original sin is wiped away, or if we're baptized as an adult or after the age of reason, any actual sins that we commit are wiped away. Uh, also, the, uh, the immersion, right, the sign of that is the sign of going down into the water is symbolic of going down into the tomb with Christ and then coming out of the water, rising to Christ to new life, the new life of grace, right? Going down to the old life of sin, right? Bearing the old life of sin, rising to the new life of grace, of sanctifying grace. Um, so those, you see how it works? So, right, the, the sacraments, there's a visible, tangible ritual or, and matter and form that points then to some spiritual reality, some spiritual effect. So if we think about that in terms of the Eucharist, right, what is the um, matter of the Eucharist? And then we can talk about the remote matter, which is just the actual physical material that's used, and then the actual ritual, okay, that is, um, is, is performed. So what's the matter? What's the remote matter, first of all? What's the, so what's the actual physical stuff that we use in celebrating the Eucharist? Bread and wine. Bread and wine. Yeah. Well, the, the remote matter, just the physical stuff that's used in the sacrament is just the, the bread and the wine. Okay. Now, the, we'd say the the proximate matter, here's what we just read, okay? So in the, in the prior, in the second question, in what way is the Eucharist a memorial, right? It says, the sacrificial, uh, let's see. Sacrificial character of the Holy Eucharist is manifested in the very words of institution. Okay, so we would say, this is my body which is given up for you Right? This is a cup of my blood which will be shed for you. Right? The words, the form, kind of makes sense of what's going on. Right? Those are very sacrificial kind of words, right? Uh, right? The, my body given up for you, my blood shed for you. Right? Um, but what Pius XII is saying is that there's actually something just like the pouring of the water kind of shows the spiritual effect of the washing of the sin, of a way of, of, of sins, the washing with water, it kind of shows that spiritual, what, what's actually going on, the spiritual effect. What, so what Pius XII is saying here is that, so, so what's the spiritual effect in the Eucharist? First of all, we need to ask that question. What is the spiritual effect? Is that the sacrifice of Christ is made present, okay? And that we can be united to that sacrifice, which is how it affects our souls. But how is the sacrifice made present, right? That's what Pius XII is saying. And what he, what he talks about here is, I think, very beautiful. We think about, so he says, by the transubstantiation of bread into the body of Christ and the wine into his blood, both his body and blood are rendered really present. So we haven't talked about a sacrifice yet. We just said Christ's body and blood are made present. But it says, but the Eucharistic species under which he is present symbolize the violent separation of his body and blood. And so a commemorative showing forth of the death which took place in reality on Calvary. So what he's saying there is, like when you, if you think about it, when I consecrate the bread and the wine, right? 
what do I do? I say, this is my body, which will be given up for you. And I raise it up. And that in and of itself, the raising up of the, the host, right, is symbolic of Christ being raised up on the cross. And so you can even say there's a ritual that sort of points to sacrifice, the sacrifice of the cross there, right? But what Pius is saying, which is really, I think, neat, and St. Thomas Aquinas talks about this too, is that the priest doesn't say, this is my body, this is my blood, and raise them up together, right? He, he, he consecrates them separately, right? And so that separation of Christ's body and blood is symbolic of the shedding of Christ's blood, right? If you think about a violent death, Right? It's when, and we talk about this in, oftentimes with people that, you know, um, died in war. Right? We talk about it. he shed his blood for his country. Right? So that symbolism that's there in the separate consecrations, separate consecration of the body, separate consecration of the blood, right? We're sacramentally shedding Christ's blood, which sacramentally, sacramentally points to his sacrifice on the cross and makes present his sacrifice, true sacrifice on the cross. Well, does that kind of make sense? Is that, um, so it's through those separate consecrations, which is what Pius is talking about, right, that we see the sort of ritual that's happening of the sacrificial shedding of Christ's blood by sacramentally shedding Christ's blood and separating his body and his blood by the separate consecrations, right? So in the Eucharist, right, that sacrifice is truly made present to us. And as I said, what's the spiritual effect? Well, the spiritual effect is that Christ's sacrifice is made present. But then the question for us is, in what way does the church participate in the Eucharistic sacrifice? So here, this is the compendium number 281. In the Eucharist, the sacrifice of Christ becomes also the sacrifice of the members of his body. The lives of the faithful, their praise, their sufferings, their prayers, their works are united to those of Christ. Inasmuch as it is a sacrifice, the Eucharist is likewise offered for all the faithful, living and dead, in reparation for the sins of all to obtain spiritual and temporal benefits from God. The church in heaven is also united to the offering of Christ. So once again, go back to what I was talking about, about Mary at the foot of the cross, right? We have the opportunity to be there present at the foot of the cross, right? And to be united to Christ's sacrifice, which he offered for the salvation of the world, to unite our hearts, right? He says, you know, our, our praise, our sufferings, right? our sacrifices, our prayers, our work, right? What are we supposed to be doing at mass? It's not a spectator thing. We don't go to Mass just to listen to the homily, right? And it, I'm going to just go off of my little soapbox here, right? The Mass is not a service, right? The Mass is, is the holy sacrifice of the Mass, right? We, and I often hear people kind of tell me that after Mass. Like, nice service, Father. I'm like, well, not a Protestant service, right? What, we, what did we just do? We, we were there at the sacrifice of Calvary, right? It was the sacrifice of the Mass, the holy sacrifice, and, you know, the homily may or may not be good, but that's not the most important thing about the, the Mass either. Um, so we are there to bring, as, as you were, I think, getting at, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to bring the Lord all of our sufferings, all of our sacrifices, all of our works, all of our efforts that we've had to be faithful, that we've sort of put forth to be faithful to God, right? And to bring those to Christ and to unite them to Christ's sacrifice, which once again is being made present, the most powerful prayer that ever was offered, the, the sacrificial death of the Son offering his life to the Father for the salvation of the world, right? And to unite all of these things to Christ's sacrifice to the Father, which is made present in the Mass, right? And if you think about it, right, and it, as it says here, right, that this... This is the most powerful prayer in the world, right? And it's offered for all the faithful, living and dead, in reparation for the sins of all, to obtain spiritual and temporal benefits from God. 
right? There's never been a more powerful prayer than the sacrifice of the cross, the offering of, of Christ to the Father for the salvation of the world, right? And so say the mass is the most powerful sacrifice and we bring all of our prayers, all of our needs, all of our sacrifices to Christ in the mass to be offered to the Father, right, uh, in the holy sacrifice. So anyways, I had 30 minutes. I've gone way over already, I know. Uh, but there's so much more, and I really want to encourage you um, to spend some time really grow, growing in your understanding of the Mass as a sacrifice. Because once again, we do this every Sunday, and it's such a tragedy. We all know, I hope, that there's a crisis in the church, a very serious crisis. You know, I mean, the statistics are like 20 to 30 percent of Catholics attend Mass regularly, right? And why is that? I mean, I think one of the main reasons, because we don't understand what the Mass is, right? And even, to be honest with you, talking about the Mass in terms of um, the real presence or even just receiving communion um, is missing something really essential. And not understanding the Mass as a sacrifice, I think, is, is, a, is a big problem, and it's a big you know, gap and crisis in our catechesis. Um, you know, during COVID, I would often hear people say that, that, you know, well, you know, I want to come back and receive communion. That's great. That's great. But the Mass is more than that, right? And we could have just sort of set up a car line, you know, for, to give people communion. And a lot of people were kind of doing stuff like that, which I think is, is fine. But once again, we, we gave the wrong impression even by sort of setting up the live stream stuff and by giving the impression that this was sort of an alternative to being present at mass, right? And I, I'm having to correct people now who kind of say, well, I couldn't go to mass, but I watched it online, you know? I'm like, no, it's not, it's not a substitute. Um, it's very different than being present and actually being united to the sacrifice there um, in person. Uh, but Anyways, that's my soapbox. Uh, so I, I, want, uh, I left you with a couple of, or a few questions there. And these are sort of loaded questions. Uh, but I, I hope that the way I've described the mass to you makes you sort of step back and maybe be a little critical of your experience of the mass in some places. I know this is going to sound very sort of presumptuous, but, you know, there's a lot of places that you go for Mass where your experience with the way the Mass is celebrated, with the, the reverence, even with the music, with some of the other kind of silly things that happen in some of the liturgies, right? Does that align with what the Mass is, Right the holy sacrifice of the mass, the sacrifice of Calvary. Does the, sometimes the attitudes that we see even amongst priests towards the way that mass is celebrated and even some of the goofy, I'll say mu the goofy music that we experience, uh, does that really mesh with what the mass is? And I would say, unfortunately, no, in a lot of, in a lot of places. And um, so I, um, I asked some questions to help you kind of think about maybe those sorts of questions, right? The Eucharistic liturgy makes present the sacrifice of Christ, which is a historical event, but nonetheless continues eternally in the heavenly liturgy. What are some concrete ways that parishes ought to manifest this reality in the way that the liturgy is celebrated? And then since the Eucharistic liturgy is also the sacrifice of Christ's body, how do we as a church enter more fully into the sacrifice, right? What does active participation in the liturgy really mean? Once again, a little soapbox, Second Vatican Council talked about active participation in the liturgy. And a lot of people thought that to mean, well, then I, that means I need to be a lector or be a Eucharistic extraordinary minister or an usher, right? That's what it means to be an active participant in the Eucharist, right? No, I mean, those things are, are good things, right? We need people to serve in those ministries, but that's not theologically what the council was getting at. And, um, and then... Finally, there's a real crisis in the church with regard to attendance at mass. 
what can be done to renew people's desire to participate in the Mass more faithfully. Um, I don't know how much time do we have. I mean, when we, have I gone way over? Sorry. We can take about 10 minutes for exploring the discussion. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, yeah, discuss amongst yourself, yourselves. And, well, thank you, guys. All right. Thank <laughs> you.